Hello, everyone. It's a pleasure for me to be here today with uh, my colleague and friend, Dr. Freeman Rabowski, who is the president of the University of Maryland in Baltimore College and has been the president for 30 years. And he has very generously agreed to actually discuss with us some of his thoughts in terms of what we are seeing as major challenges across the country, uh, very specifically the underrepresentation and the discrimination among um, against African Americans that has become so evident right now uh, amidst the COVID pandemic and the emergence of mistreatment of um, men of color um, that should have not happened and that has made us uh, keenly aware about how we cannot continue doing the, the things the way that we were doing and that we have to make dramatic transformative changes so that this doesn't happen anymore. Uh, as being the director of the National Institutes on Drug Abuse, I've been, of course, particularly sensitive to two components um, that are brought up by the COVID epidemic. One of them is how negatively it's affecting uh, the African Americans, how the mortality is so much higher uh, among African Americans than, than Caucasians. And, and this is driven very much by structural racism and all of the lack of opportunities that we, we get. But from the science perspective is how do we change this and how do one of the, the areas that we've struggled all alone is the lack of representation of African-American scientists in the research enterprise. And, and these two very important subject matters, I think are, are coming to a, a point where it is, the, I mean, imperative that we actually come up with strategies to change it. That's in, in, in that thinking that I am borrowing your brain um, because I actually, I'm going to start to ask you by a question that since you are the expert, you have shown that you can very much expand the representation of uh, underrepresented groups, including African-Americans in science, which has been deemed by many that it was not possible. You have shown clearly that it is possible. And one of your quotes, you say, I mean, I've, you've given the opportunity to imagine, to, to place themselves, what it would be to be a scientist, which is not something that, that many people have had in their lives and certainly of underrepresented groups. So can you expand on that? Um, because you've applied it to what has led you to be successful. I appreciate that. I'm honored to be here, Dr. Bocal. Nora, we are we're, we're very excited about the success that we're having at the University of Maryland, Baltimore County, UMBC, uh, because we are determined to produce more and more scientists of all races and have had a lot of success with African Americans and, and others uh, and whites um, and Latinos. Now, the, the Meyerhoff program at UMBC is the leading, because of that program, we are the leading producer of blacks who get MD PhDs, who go on to get MD PhDs in the country. And the the secret to that success I talk about in our in my TED talk on success in science. What you know is that the majority of Americans of all races who begin with a major in science leave it within the first year or two. We call those courses around the country weed out courses. So the first part of success has to do with strengthening what we do in teaching and learning in the first two years of the work, of understanding who has a chance of making it, what support they need, and how do we give them the kind of inspiration to make sure that they imagine becoming a PhD or an MD or an MD PhD. And so for us, it has been a matter of having that vision to say, how do we, it's not about how do we help students get through a program, it's about how do we bring excitement to the science? How do we help them understand what science can do to help humankind? And so in that TED talk, we talk about the high expectations and that just, that's not just for our students, that's for our professors, for all of us. What do we do to support people? Building community among the students. And then most important for NIH and others, it takes scientists to produce scientists. In any area, we want to pull people into the work, get them into those labs. And then finally, rigorous evaluation. And by all counts, we're doing the right things. We're trying to produce more and more of these students who will be uh, leading scientists in the country. And they are. You already have produced some really remarkable scientists that are leaders in the country. And, and it's not just that they are doing great science, but they are inspiring others. Yes, so they yes. are as attractors and mentors. And I think this is extraordinary. 
And I think one of the issues in, in looking at what you have, been, uh, you have been doing and why you have been so successful is your program has enabled uh, something that interferes many times with science in general in young people, and that's that self-confidence yeah. that you can do it. And, yes. and have visiting your program, it was extremely rewarding at me, at least for me, to uh -huh. see how emboldened those young people, your students were. Yes, I appreciate so, that. Let me, you know, just your, your point about the, 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 this intersection between getting to become proficient in the science and believing in themselves is what you're saying, this sense of confidence. We have to give people, women, people of color, African-Americans and others this sense, you can do this. It takes hard work. A curiosity is so important, but you can do this. And this is what our faculty colleagues have worked to do with staff there to build that confidence, to push them to be better than they even thought they could be. And then to give them examples right now. I mean, and many of these examples are people who've been funded by NIH from Dr. Kafri Zarasi, who's down at Duke, all the way over to right there, Dr. Kizmikia Corbett, very proud of her and the work with the vaccine development. Uh, Dr. Caitlin Sattler, who's there at NIH now leading the study for the asymptomatic patients. All of these are, these are scientists of all races, those first two African-Americans, who have that confidence that you're talking about. It does take confidence to do it. But I would say one more thing, and you know this, it takes an appreciation of hard work. It really takes the passion that leads to the hard work and the curiosity and an attitude that says never, never, never give up. I mean, it, it, I don't know how to say that to Americans more forcefully, that we have to have that passion for what science can do. And what I'm saying to my students about examples as we show them people that are the types I just mentioned is you could be one of them. You could be Dr. Corbett one day, you could be Dr. Sattler one day and lead things that can save millions of lives. There's something about that that gives those of us in STEM goosebumps. And we need Americans getting goosebumps about what science can do for humankind. I mean, I don't think that there has ever been a period in my existence at least where there has ever been a clearer message that science is what's going to solve the problem that we're facing yes. right now. Yes. And but it, I always it, 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 no, and I was just, just going to say that uh -huh. it, it's, it's provided that there is that humanitarian component. So science and yes. humanism is yes. what's going to address it. Yes. And you I deal with all of them. That. It is so important to say that, you know, with our students, we are talking constantly about the science, whether it's biochemistry or neuroscience and about the ethical implications and, and what it means to be human itself. So the arts, humanity, social science is more important than ever. Uh, and we need to be saying that, that yes, the science, the public health, very critical. At the same time, this is a period when we need to understand what it means to be human. And we need to be teaching our young scientists more about the, the humanities, just as we should be teaching our artists and humanities folks how they can take advantage of what we learn in science. We need, and above transcending all of that, I would say today, the importance of evidence and um, expert advice and listening to the experts. This is what we have to teach everybody from pre-K through 12 to the higher education program to the citizenry in general. Yeah, you have my brain jumping from one idea to the other because there are so many <laughs> questions that I want to ask you. And one of them, as we were discussing it, but then I got distracted, is mm -hmm. the concept that one of the elements that you highlight in the program uh, is that of building up a community. And yes. you put it as one of the four pillars that's necessary mm -hmm. to actually facilitate the success of these young people. Yes. Do you want to comment on that? Because we, I mean, what we're trying to do is, of course, emulate what you have been able to do because it's so, so successful. Yes. So I, I, yes, let me just say, I mean, it, that building community is critical. And some of the national agencies, beginning with NIH, are doing more and more of that. When we look at the BUILD program, when we look at the uh, Minority Access to Research Careers, program, all the programs that over the years that have talked about training, at the undergrad and grad level, Dr. Mike Summers, who has NIH grants for the grad level with UMB downtown with our medical school, we are talking about bringing students, undergrad in one case, grad in others, with faculty to talk about problems, to look at how they're going about solving problems. But it also allows us to understand the human challenges that people are facing. 
You know, I think that when you think about a training program, yes, you're, you're, you're teaching people how you, how you add to the problem solving process, but you're building trust among scientists. And as you build that trust, they can build synergy to help them in problem solving, but also to understand human beings have problems beyond the science. And it's so important for people to know how to support each other, even beyond the science. I, you know, I was talking with Dr. Corbett recently, and she was saying she was getting encouragement from so many young scientists who had been her fellow students at UMBC, Myerhoff and others. And she said, it just makes such a difference to have, and then people that NIH who are supporting it. And that's, I think that, that anybody would say, we can do so much more when there are other people who give us support and who also can be honest in saying when we're off track or when we need to get back on track. So it's not always sugary. It can be about uh, strong criticism. I think one piece of what we work to do at UMBC is to teach students, whether they're in the sciences or humanities, that feedback, critical feedback is very important. To develop the tough skin to, that will say that a, we'll have a student or a young scientist saying to a mentor, tell me what you really think. Just tell me what you really think. Am I doing well? Am I sucking at this or am I doing better? How can I improve? The only way people get better is by hearing different perspectives about performance and then they can push to go to the next level. But as you say, I mean, to do that, you have to build up an environment of trust. And, That's it. and as I, That's it. I'm thinking about the remarkable job that you've done with the Majorhoff program. Um, you also, it also brings to mind another quote that you speak about from Aristotle that you say that it's choice and not chance that determines our destiny. Yes. But when you look at actually uh, the concept of where we, each one of us stands, we realize that our circumstances are not the same for everyone and that yes. that choice that you make may be much harder for someone else. So when you speak about emboldening someone and, and teaching them not to ever give up, Yes. You actually have to consider what are the conditions and how do we bring someone that may have come from a very deprived environment there. I mean, so, so what are your thoughts? Because I'm sure you've yeah. thought about this. Yeah, yeah. I, I've been using the, the quote, excellence is never an accident. It is a result of high intention, sincere effort, and intelligent execution. And then it says, choice, not chance, determines destiny. And And, and it's so true, except I was talking with young faculty uh, um, about this and, and one said, but what, what happens when the child doesn't have a chance to make a choice? Yeah. And we, that began another conversation that if you're privileged and you can look around and see the options and make choices, that's one thing. But when you've never had someone teach you the about the possibilities, or you've not had someone teach you how to read and think well, for example, or the importance of going to school, then your universe of choices becomes so limited that you, you really don't have the chance. So it is important for us to, to say both things, that when you have that chance, think carefully about your choice but, and your choices. But to remember so many children and people are in such a difficult situation, they don't have the chance right now. And that's why all the other challenges we're facing with structural racism in our country are, are so important right now that we, that we don't isolate science from the issues of structural racism. That, that, and that's not about somebody being a good person or not. It is about the fact that some groups have had advantages that other groups have not had and that people tend to choose people like themselves. So it's not just science, it's all of higher education. 80% of all faculty are still white in America, even though we're moving towards 40 some percent of kids of color, I mean, of our college kids of color. And people will even very quickly say, well, we can't find anyone. I would say this, and I've, I've seen you do this, Dr. Volkow, Nora, um, when you want to find somebody with talent, you can find somebody with talent. You can help build that talent, you see. Uh, many times people are with extraordinary ability, but have not had the mentoring or the other word I use, or somebody as a champion to take them to the next level. When we have people who are willing to work with young people with the curiosity and with the brain power, we can take them to that level. So that there is really no excuse for this country 
being so underrepresented in higher education broadly when thinking about the professoriate, which is the most powerful part, or when thinking about scientists at the national agencies. Not one agency can tell me that even 2% in America, that even 2% of the scientists are black. That speaks to structural issues that we need to face. And also, Freeman, as I, and, and you've, you've written about it, and, and certainly, I mean, there is the issue of the pipeline, and you are hi highlighting the whole concept of how crucial education is. And before we join in, we were discussing now this virtual technology. So since you are so innovative, I mean, I'm just throwing it at you. Don't, don't you think that access to these virtual technologies can equalize the quality of the education that we can give to young people. I mean, have you started to think about how to move that forward? Because in the it, past, you were in a rural area and there's no school. Sure, uh, sure, but, sure. But now you have virtual um, curriculum. The, the, the virtual can be helpful as a tool, but, but let me start by saying uh, the quality of teaching and learning uh, will depend heavily on the strength of that teacher, number one, and number two, the support we give to a family so that that family can help that child with the work. If that, if that family does not have anyone who is able to get a job, doesn't have the skills to get a job, and they are dealing with all kinds of challenges, including drugs, then that child is not getting the support that that child needs. Uh, a middle-class person's child of any race is gonna be getting far more support from that family environment. But a part of the structural discrimination we're talking about here involves all the ways in which families are not able to do for their children because they're struggling trying to find a way to get some food for the house, you see. So, so the virtual can be a tool, but there are other factors that have to go into that that I would say are very important. And so on the one hand, we need to be looking at how these different factors from the academic performance of children uh, the economic challenges the family is facing, uh, the support the family gets in understanding what it can do to help that child, and the quality of teaching, um, particularly in the lower levels. As I've worked with international math competitions and some of those challenges, um, you remember I'm a mathematician. I get goosebumps doing math. I want more Americans to get goosebumps doing math because if you can do math, you can do so much of science and engineering. But the, the fact is that we don't prepare our teachers in K through eight to know a lot of math. Those who are good in math, and there's some wonderful teachers who do a great job in K through eight, but one of the factors we need to consider will be how to give those teachers stronger math backgrounds. It's, it's difficult to teach algebra in the sixth or seventh grade, if you don't at least have some fundamental understanding of calculus. To teach one thing, you need to know something about the next level, to put it in perspective. And unfortunately, if you look at the, the, the education that our teachers get, it's not strong in math, but teachers who tend to be the strongest in math are those who were good in math in high school, who may have had calculus in high school. And the big fear that so many teachers have is that a parent will either be a scientist or an engineer because they're going to explain a problem differently from the way the teacher does it. And if the teacher doesn't have a strong background, he or she may only have one way to solve it and may not understand how the scientist or engineer explains it. I chaired the Maryland Commission on Math and Science and STEM Education some years ago. And the big fear that, that, that we found was that teachers were often afraid of math. If you are afraid of math, you don't teach it. You teach the other things you see. And so, when I think about what our children are experiencing, we need to give more support to teachers in all types of school systems, more support to families, and the use of technology. It's the combination. If we could be teaching the child and a parent as we're working on word problems, it would make a big difference. So, and then finally, from your perspective as at NIH, the more we take what we learn about neuroscience and the, the learning process in order to help teachers understand how they can be most effective in explaining concepts, the more impressive the work will become. And you know, Freeman, I'm asking this question because I, I want you to imagine and to fantasize where we would want to be as a society as it relates to giving everyone a proper education. Yeah. What the neuroscience is showing now is that socioeconomical deprivation is associated with adverse effects to the human brain of our children. So yeah. it has a negative effect. And, and interestingly, uh, we, but it's not surprising because the brain actually emerges and develops as a function 
of the complexity of the challenges that you are encountering. And education, that's one of the important components of education, to force you into these uh, new uh, universes that make you, force you to think and see associations. Yes. If you're not exposed to them through your parents, your family, or, or school, your, your, your development is going to be affected by it. And so, so that's, that's why I say, how would you like to imagine within the context of all of that? Obviously, there are a lot of challenges. So it's not a pie out there in the sky, but, but how can we tangibly achieve that? I think we begin by using what the psychologists call a strengths-based approach. Uh, UMBC works with about 500 children who are first-time offenders between the ages of eight and 17. And we work with them 24 hours a day, seven days a week. They're heavily black boys, some Latino boys, some girls, but heavily black boys. These are all children who committed nonviolent crimes and we keep them out of jail. And we literally seven days a week, 24 hours a day. And what I can tell you is that some of these children are extraordinary thinkers. They're all amazingly intelligent and, and quick. Once you get them to talk, but they start off and there's a hardness that they have because of their environment. But what I've come to know over the 30 years we've been doing this work, we've served about 25,000 families, is that they have learned so much about how to survive in life that those of us with PhDs would have a really hard time negotiating what some of these 12 year olds can do right now. I think people would be shocked to know the ways in which they use their brains just to survive to stay out of the way of bullets, to decide how they're gonna deal with drugs. And we're trying to pull them away from the drugs because the drugs are such a, a reasonable alternative for making money for your mother, you see. And yet they have in a variety of ways developed strategies for surviving and helping a little sister or helping a mother. The question is how do we use those strengths that they've developed to look at that side of school? I've done it with word problems. And I have been amazed sometimes at how quickly people can grasp concepts when they've been dealing with hard problems involving money and drugs. You'd be surprised just in, in amounts of and um, challenges that involve how you look at all the facts you have and choose the facts that are most critical to solving the problem and you take away all those that are not. And so in terms of their skills, in, in many cases, the, 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 the issue of poverty, it seems to me, has been preparing kids to deal with rough situations. But at the same time, we need to use whatever they've learned to build on it to help them with the reading and thinking that that is so important. I will tell you this. If you give me a child who can read and think well, I can teach her to solve word problems. You see, uh, and, and when you think about academic success, if you can get the strong reading and computational skills going and you learn more about technology and how you can look up things and do research, um, you're on your way. You're on your way. So the K through 12 has to involve more work with neuroscientists, with teachers, with families and with children as we think of that. At the undergrad level, I would argue that we could increase substantially the number of black scientists by strengthening what we do in all kinds of universities in the first two years. That, that strengthening would help not only uh, black freshmen and sophomores, but students of other backgrounds. The majority of students who begin with a major in science leave it within the first two years, the majority of all races. And so it's not just an issue about blacks, it's in general, but some of the things we've been doing involving course redesign and uh, professional development for faculty and building community among students. The, the BUILD program is a great example of that. And the other programs that we work with NIDA on in using the Meyerhoff and others to build community are critical to making sure we produce more students. I would say the one thing I want you to think about is how NIH can take what it does with high school students, college students, grad students, and postdocs and build a more robust continuum, pipeline if you want to call it, where you work with those students every step of the way with the idea that by the time they get to that postdoc, they're ready to become a scientist at NIH. There are too many students who come through and don't move on to science positions there. And the, the other part of that is 
and to have a group looking at their development to see what's going well, how can the NIH scientists work even more collaboratively with universities to make this happen. It, it can be done, it just takes a kind of a, a rigorous approach of thinking through what is working right now and what is not working. But one, one of the concepts, and, I, and absolutely, I mean, we are very aware that we need to actually expand the pipeline, but um, you speak about how do you motivate um, uh, young people to, to look into science as the exciting discipline that it is, and also as a discipline that is going to come up with solutions that right. will enable us to get rid of this structural racism and the over-representation of adverse outcomes for for African Americans, how do you inspire people? How yes, do you motivate yes. them? Yes. You, you, when students get into labs uh, in high school and see problems being solved by real human beings, they become interested. Some of our best students have worked in summer labs in high school, in the Baltimore Washington corridor, for example, um, and they come in knowing they have good hands already. Um, Kizmikia had worked down in, at Chapel Hill in summer, so she came in knowing she really loved the biology and so was ready to do it. So that's the first step. But I'm saying to you, the more we can have opportunities for students to work in labs during the summers and sometimes during the year, they do it on our campuses right now, and to work on, and so for us, it's a big deal that many of our undergrads will publish in referee journals as undergraduates. Once they get that paper, either presenting a paper or publishing a paper as a second author, for example, and they've earned at least Bs in the science courses in the first two years, they're on their way. They're on their way. They can just get solid Bs. They're on their way. Now, some will get As. But, I mean, the, the real challenge is to get them through the first two years. They get through the organic chemistry, the genetics, the cell, with solid Bs, sometimes As, right? They're on their way. And they publish a paper. They are excited. They're really excited and giving them opportunities to talk about the science. I come and see our sophomores who can talk the science. I mean, people will think they're grad students. We want students talking to science all the time. And we want them this summer, the mild kids are in a course in race and science and culture. We want them understanding why science is important for people of all backgrounds, that it doesn't belong to one group, one gender, it belongs to all of us. It's a part of the, of the, the effort of humankind to seek the truth and to solve problems. And so that's the way you pull people into the work. So how do we amplify you, Freeman? Uh, how do we clone you in a virtual <laughs> world? I mean, I, it is, right? I mean, because you can make a huge impact, but how do we learn from that? And I understand that uh, some of the universities are um, emulating your programs, but, but yes. how do you take that momentum and your long yes. knowledge and expertise to really expand it? Let me tell you, I, I want people to visit with us at UMBC because I don't know a campus that has more faculty who are so excited about bringing more Blacks and Latinos and women into the work. Um, and, and that's from Dr. Phyllis Robinson in biology to Dr. Mike Summers in chemistry, and I can go on and on. And, and here's the point for me that I'm, the dean and the provost, Dr. LaCourse and the pro, they're all involved. We need universities to think about their culture. Too often when people think about minorities in science, it's a very nice young minority person running the program. We need tenured faculty. They are the ones with power. We need deans of science and provosts who are excited. So while I might be a champion for all of this, it is the culture of UMBC, not only among the scientists, but among my humanities and arts people who are working to build these leaders from people who are in the sciences, yeah, but for people who are in the humanities and who are studying these things. Uh, I love the fact that our Surgeon General is a UMBC graduate and studied both the humanities and the sciences and traveled in Africa. So we've got all kinds of people who are uh, learning how to work on the challenges that we face. And, and one of the points that's so important is that scientists are not separated from the rest of the world. They have to be seen as in the middle of things. And the challenge of giving them the support to show how the science can help people is what we all have to do.
We absolutely do. The issues that there's an article coming out today in uh, Proceedings of, National, of the National Academy of Sciences, written by two of my colleagues and me, Peter Henderson and Kate Tracy, on these issues. And then we refer to several items in issues of science and technology. The one strategy I would raise is this. There are about 25 universities that have done a better job in producing black scientists than any others. Some are HBCUs, others are like us. And one of the suggestions is that we think about replication of the kind Howard Hughes has been doing with Chapel Hill, or the Mile program with Chapel Hill, Penn State, now Zuckerberg Foundation with Berkeley and San Diego. But I honestly think that national agencies should look at those institutions that have been most successful and go laser focused in figuring out how to double those numbers and replicate those programs. You know, so it's not me- a matter of this. It's important to do. focus, focus, focus is what we need to do. Yeah, yeah, no, and I think that that you basically said something that I just immediately struck my imagination. Mm-hmm. The concept that your faculty is driven by the excitement yes. of having yes. been successful in yes. bringing this extraordinary, diverse and impressive environment. So I, I, I like to actually challenge you because we are uh, basically time has sure. run off. Sure. So <laughs> and I want to give you an opportunity to ask any question or comments that you may want. But let me, let me ask you, we've met several times, we've had discussions and I sort of say, OK, and, and what is it that uh, so if we say ourselves, we're now in front of one another virtually, uh, is there something that we could want to start now um, taking advantage of innovation and, and, and the, the need of urgency that the COVID pandemic has brought into us. Yes. For you and I, you as the leader of an organization and me as director yeah. of NIDA, yeah. To, yeah. To, to basically move forward. So what would yes. you tell me, Nora, what is, what is it that you would yes. like to, I, to no, propose? You, you, Listen, this is like candy to a kid. I love it. I love it. They, uh, this is what I would say. This is what I would say. Let's produce together um, a group of students who will be trained in disciplines in science who can focus on the problems of NIDA, who can focus on the problems in that, you know, there are connections of all kinds of drug and alcohol abuse. Let's start with students who perhaps are sophomores and let's choose some group. You're, you're working with us right now, but let's choose a group and get them inspired by the notion of working on problems that are of interest to NIDA. Let's get them connected to faculty who are uh, uh, doing the research of NIDA. Let's look at some of our faculty who may be doing research with NIDA and more to get more of them so that those labs are filled with, particularly with some African-Americans. So that so, over the next several years, we can go look back and say, this is what we've done. This is what but, we've done. So since you are so data driven, let's sort of say, OK, we will be in touch and we will monitor programs. But one year from now, let's be yes. in front of each other, whichever medium yes. it is. And yes. let's basically make ourselves accountable. Have we succeeded yes. or not? And where yeah, are I we? like that. I like that. And let's and then let's look at listen to some of those students. In the same way I would say to NIH, when you think about the graduates that I mentioned already, one working uh, on issues when Caitlin is working on issues involving the the uh, the the student the people who have not shown the sim- the asymptomatic patients, for example, when looking at the vaccine development, let's pump some that's for for the broad thing. I'm saying for us pilot wise, but NIH, let's look at how we bring, we identify really high achieving African American students and get them excited about the research of different institutes and make a commitment that if they do what they're supposed to do, we're pulling them on through the process with an eye towards having them as scientists, scientists who can help NIH. Okay. Yes, we have a task. Now, okay. do you have something to say? Because they are actually noticing me that time is running off. So, sure. No, there's something I, that I you... Think, you know what? I'm going to say this. I would like to see more people with your attitude and as Rod Pettigrew did. And so we can work with Francis and everybody else to make a difference in the numbers. We need, I'm a mathematician. I want to see us get up to five and 10% black scientists at NIH. NIH is the leading institute. It should be the one leading the path for the country to say, look at what we're doing. If, if universities see NIH doing it, yeah. and ter- yeah. you know, they will then say, then we can do it too. So I challenge all of NIH. I believe in NIH the same way I believe in our country. We can do better. That's my message. 
Yeah, no, it's a great organization, and I think that they, will, I mean, it embraces the importance of this. So certainly, I will look forward one year from now to sit down okay. in front of you. We will be yes. interacting. But um, Freeman is really um, remarkable. I appreciate very much you taking the time. I appreciate your honesty, your generosity, and your commitment towards others. And I think that, as I say, I think that the solution would be we could figure out how to clone you, but that is not a realistic right now, but there are other opportunities for innovation and sure. we'll work with them because we, we, we cannot not succeed. And we, we need to clone you also. Let me just say <laughs> It's more important to clone you, uh, Freeman. And, uh, but, but thanks a million for taking the time Thank to you. speak with us. And Thank stay you healthy. very much. Thank you. The same to you. Thank you very much. I believe in you and in NIH. Thank you. Bye-bye.